Welcome to our Martin Erdegaard special. And joining me is a very special guest to give us the download on Arsenal's imminent arrival. You're listening to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast. I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon. Hello, welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna. On this very special edition, we're going to be doing a bit of a deep dive into Martin Odegaard. We've just heard at the time of recording that the deal is done. We're just waiting for the announcement now. Martin Odegaard will join Arsenal on loan for the remainder of the season. And who better to join me to give us the download on the player uh, than Jonas Yeva, not only a Spanish football expert, but he's Norwegian as well. Jonas, (laughs) um, first of all, how you doing, mate? (laughs) I'm doing all right. How are you guys doing? It's uh, it's a sunny day here in in Oslo, Norway. Well, here it's uh, cloudy. It's been snowing the last few days. It's bloody freezing. Uh, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jonas, first of all, mate, um, how do we, uh, and I want to get this right, because this is really important to me. How do we pronounce the player's name? I want to make sure that we've got that down to a T, because I hate it when when fans just pick up their own pronunciation and just run with it because it feels easier. So how should we be saying, uh, I think I'm saying Erdegaard, is that correct? How should we be saying it? No, you're saying it wrong. Uh, Erde yeah. is correct, uh, okay. but the final part is Gård, Erdegård. Okay. Interesting. So instead Interesting. of having instead of having a a sound, you're having sort of an o sound. So it's the god Martin the god. Okay, is that because of the two a's? Is that what the two a's does in the language? Yes. Cool. Yes. We also have we also have the a with the little circle above it, which is called o. But also when we have two a's next to each other, it's also an o sound. So both of those are sort of like a thumb thumb finger rule that uh, that's an o sound instead of an ah sound as uh how you pronounce it as of right now but i'm expecting you now to say uh, the god for the foreseeable future uh, the god absolutely and i'm going to write that down go. on my on my little board in front of me so i never get that wrong uh, but that's why we wanted to know because you're the expert and i'm not <laughs> uh Jonas, um tell us a little bit about the player now we know he's somebody that uh, was picked up at a very young age by real madrid arsenal were actually uh credited with an interest in him way back then he ended up going to real madrid How's his career gone so far? And and we know that obviously he's not playing as much as he'd like right now. Uh, but in terms of kind of his progress over the years, how have you seen it? Well, it's uh, his story is sort of the fairy tale story in Norwegian football in terms of being a young wonder kid. I mean, he made his debut in Norway at how old was he? Fifteen, I think it was. I saw his uh, his full debut. I saw it at the national stadium here in Oslo. He played against a team called Vorderinga. He played for Skutse. Uh, um, and I remember one of the, one of the first things that happened was 16. He was wearing no 15. He was wearing number 67, and one of the veteran players of Vordering completely smashed into him, like took him took him completely out. And I remember sitting there with my friends, going, "Is that is is that allowed? I mean, this kid is 15. Is that is are we allowed to sort of just smash into him like that, or are the players allowed to do that?" Um, and since then, his his star just grew. I mean, he was the he was the the man of the match in that game. He he's, he's I believe the youngest goal scorer in uh, top division in Norway. He's the youngest uh, national team debutant. I mean, he I believe he's also the youngest player to play for Real Madrid in, in La Liga. So um, he became an overnight sensation in in some aspects, and then just kept that uh, going. And as you alluded to, he was. He was linked with everyone. I mean, every single team in Europe was after him. And he was also on this very uh, renowned uh, audition around Europe with the clubs that he and his father had chosen out for him to to trial at. And I believe he had been at uh, Real Madrid, Barcelona, Bayern Munich with Pep Guardiola. He had been at Liverpool. I believe he was at Arsenal. Uh, I believe he was at Man United, Man City, uh, certainly. Uh, Ajax, I think he also had a at least visited them so he was really like the, the the big name in europe and the and perhaps the biggest talent in the world and he elected to go to real madrid and and his career sort of it seemed like it had stopped a little bit because he was playing for the second team and he didn't really 
uh, he wasn't allowed to flourish because the second team in Real Madrid, I mean, you're playing with 16, 17, 18 other players who are trying to show that they are, that they deserve a chance at Real Madrid. And when you're also like the big star, like the, the player everyone is talking about, of course, there's, uh, there's people that are envious, there's jealousy, there's uh, a difficult to sort of allow yourself to, to grow, yeah. and which is why he went first to to Hayden Fane, which he where he was all right, but he, he really grew into uh, into the the Dutch top division when he played for uh, Vitesse Arnheim, where he had uh, Leonid Slutsky as his manager. We really, really decided to you know show show his stuff also in a in a bigger bigger league than the Norwegian league. And and his season at, at, at Real Sociedad last season was yeah for for the first half was was absolutely fantastic as well. In in terms of stylistically, what what type of player are Arsenal getting here? There's a need at the Emirates Stadium right now for an uh, attacking, creative midfield player. Probably a central one is is what we're we're after. And we know that, you know, Emil Smith-Rowe has really burst onto the scene lately, but he's still young. There's still, in my opinion, too much pressure on him. Stylistically, are we getting exactly that? Somebody who can create opportunities, who can help the team to be that little bit more uh, or give us a little bit more of a spark in that kind of final third? Certainly. Uh, I think what will be necessary for uh, Dugoid is to have uh, freedom and, and sort of creative control. I mean, he needs to be a, he, he needs to be let loose and he needs to be given the ball and he needs to be in touch with the ball in order to to uh, to flourish, I suppose. And and if I'm to compare him to a player and this is a vague comparison because I don't want him to be, you know, hailed as the next or a new something. Um, but it, it says a lot that one of the, the, the teams that were interested in him now were Real Sociedad again. They wanted to, to loan him again. And then there was supposedly, I mean, according to reports, uh, Real Madrid didn't want to go or let him go there because Real Sociedad wanted a, a buy option. Um, and the player that sort of has taken over for uh, the goal at, at Real Sociedad is, is David Silva. And uh, in, in some aspects, they are quite similar in, in that they are creative and then th- that they sort of glue the team together if given creative control to do so. I think obviously Silva is much more mature and has a greater standing and, and is wiser in, in the things that he does. But then again, I think uh, the goal has that youthful exuberance and, and perhaps a bit more energy that, than Silva has. So, um, but I think I think uh, playing him, uh, playing because Arsenal play oftentimes a three-four-three. Three. I mean, playing him uh, as uh, the right-sided player uh, on in the attacking third, or to drift in and be more creative. Uh, I think would be uh, beneficiary to him. Or if you play four-two-three-one, he plays he plays off the striker. Yeah, I think the four-two-three-one is is kind of what Mikel is is kind of molding yeah. the team towards in the last few weeks for sure and and Emil Smith Rowe has almost forced him into making that change because he's come in and he's really impressed and he's really tied things together in that final third which is obviously what we're looking uh for uh the gourd have I said that right that time there you go there you go, <laughs> there you go. very good what, what we're looking for him uh to do as well um why has it not really worked out for him at Real Madrid? Is it just simply that there's too many good players in his way? Is it personal? Is it Dan? Is it just, is he not quite at that level? What, what do you think it's been uh, down to? There are a few reasons. Uh, one is that is, he has simply not been good enough. He's not been able to 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 take sort of the mantle of, of Luka Modric. And, and I think what was... Uh, the plan this season was for Luka Modric to step more and more back and for Odegaard to step more and more in. But what has happened is that Luka Modric is playing some of his best football again at Real Madrid. So, I mean, he's not showing any signs of slowing down. And Odegaard has just not been able to, to stake his claim in that team. And, and when you also add in the fact that he's been injured and he's not had consistent football, because that is extremely important to him um, to be have a consistent run uh, in, in any, any team. Um, he's just not been able to show his stuff and he's not been able to rekindle what he showed for the first half of his uh, stint at, at, at Real Sociedad. So I think um, Arsenal presents an opportunity to him uh, if he's allowed to play. And, and you, alluded to, you alluded to Emil Smith-Rowe. And, and one of the things that sort of made me you know, perk up a little bit was that why is he going there? Because Smith-Rowe is doing so well. And, and is, he, is he guaranteed a spot in that team? And I'd, I'd say no, uh, con- all things considered. And considering Arsenal are on a very good run now, I wouldn't sort of chop and change that as of right now. And and, uh, the goal would obviously not go there if he's not to play. So um, I do I do wonder what his role is supposed to be in that team and if he's supposed to sort of be given the keys to the Emirates as of right now. Yeah, what's interesting is that 
uh, the sheer volume of games that Arsenal are having to contend with yes. right now. And I know, you know, there's been a, a, a an issue all around Europe this season because obviously we've got the European Championships in the summer. The season's all kicked off late. So we're trying to condense it all. But Arsenal between at the time of recording and the end of February will have to play nine matches. Uh, including a two-legged tie with Benfica, uh, a game against Manchester City, trips to Aston Villa and Wolves, which are always difficult, and of course the visit of Manchester United on Saturday. So it feels like to me he's being brought in to uh, support Emil Smith Rowe, i.e. they'll probably be rotated. Um, but what I'm a little bit worried about, and and you obviously watch some Premier League football as well, do you feel like there'll be a period of time where he needs to adapt? And have we got time for that? Because it is just a very short-term deal. Yes, that is one of the big concerns. And also, he's electing a new league. He's electing a new culture. I mean, uh, Norwegians are naturally very Anglophile. We, we, uh, we watch the Premier League first and then every other league second. Even our own league, I think, is, is almost coming into second place with the, with the Premier League. So, so it's not like he's going to a country and to a culture that he's not familiar with. I believe he is a Liverpool fan. Uh, so, I mean, he, he's, he's been following, I think Steven Gerrard is his big idol. Um, so he's, he's obviously, he knows the Premier League and he knows, um, how the league works and functions. I, I would believe that he's watched Arsenal <clears throat> play, excuse me. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, but what is strange is that he's, I believe it's since 2016 now he's changed team once a year, every single year. I believe it's been uh, Hayden Fane, Fites, Real Sociedad, back to Real Madrid. So, I mean, he's he's not found a place where he can relax. He's not found a place where he can sort of, um, you know, find a home. He was supposed yeah. to do that at Real Sociedad because it was supposed to be a two-year loan. But then uh, two things happened. Number one, he was so good. He was much better than everyone had expected at Real Sociedad. And the second thing was COVID-19, which meaning that Real Madrid weren't able to buy players. So they had to cut costs and and to sort of refurbish their team a little bit. They had to find uh, the players that they'd loaned out and see who they thought would be able to to you know contribute something to their team as of right now. And Martin Odegaard was the elected one. So and, and in some aspects, um, that doesn't seem to have been the right decision. And that would also uh, be the first wrong decision almost in Martin Odegaard's career because every single league he's gone to and every loan stint he's gone to, he's somehow succeeded. Even the Hayden Fein loan, he, he, he didn't do too well at the beginning, but it was his first sort of taste with um, a bigger league than, than the Norwegian league. Um, and he then later showed that he was, it was much better when he played for Fites. So, so obviously he's, he's not afraid to take chances. He's not afraid to, to try and acclimatize himself to a league, but at the same time, it's a new dressing room. It's a new dressing room. It's a new city. He has to get used to, uh, the different routines. And, and as you, as you alluded to as well, it's very short amount of time. I mean, it, it's a, it's a, it's a simple loan as, as of, what I understand, uh, it's there's no buy option there. There's no obligation to buy. There's no sale with a buyback clause. Nothing along those lines. So he's there for the end of the season or until the end of the season. But one thing that's that I, I assume is an interesting point here, and, and you mentioned it, uh, the European Championships. Norway don't play that. We're not going to be playing there. So you can basically use him without thinking that he's going to be scared or or, or yeah. think that he might injure himself for the Euros. He, he, we're not playing that anyway. So, so for him, it's it's um, uh, it's a great chance to show himself. And whether he's going back to, to Real Madrid or if he's going to State Arsenal or go somewhere else, he has to show himself and has to show his, his stuff now for um, for the remainder of this season. So you're going to get a very motivated player. Yeah, and that for me is the key here. You know, the fact that he is motivated, the fact that he is coming in with a point to prove, the fact that he's not so. And I'm not saying that he's not a more a bigger talent than Emil, than Emil Smith Rowe, but the fact he has been in a situation where he's not playing football so far this season doesn't mean that he walks into this Arsenal side and and it completely stunts the growth and development of somebody like Emil Smith Rowe, who I think has the talent to go on and be a very good player. So I think in terms of all of those things we've discussed, it just feels like a really good fit, and obviously at a really low risk for Arsenal because. If it doesn't work out, then, you know, he goes back to Real Madrid and, and then that's the end of it. There's also been talk of the potential of maybe Arsenal and Real Madrid coming to the table if things go well, um, you know, to discuss a permanent transfer. But it feels like if he does perform, um, the, the asking price is going to be a hefty one. 
Yeah, it, it's his contract expires in the summer of 2023. So for Real Madrid's sake, if they're going to sell him, you know, in the summer would be the right right time to do so because that's when he has his highest value. Um, then again, you have to also consider if they're going to sell him, I'm going to assume that they're going to demand a buyback clause the same way that, that they did with Tottenham when they bought uh, Regilon, for example. Yep. So if Arsenal are prepared to to do that, I think that Real Madrid would be very open to to doing so. But again, it depends if he's if he's going if he becomes sort of the 2021's answer to Bruno Fernandes this uh, the remainder of the season. Of course, Real Madrid are going to to put him back in their side, but uh, and give him a new contract probably as well. So, uh, but no, I, I think I think Real Madrid would be open to to discussing uh, prolonging terms or at least for Arsenal to keep him uh, one more season if the player as well if he wants it if he wants to yeah. to go there. Uh, but that would uh, that would obviously mean that Real Madrid either have to to uh, extend his contract so they don't risk losing him. Uh, and the second one being that, uh, or, or or selling him with a buyback clause. That those are the only two things uh, I think would be, uh, or that Arsenal just break the bank like they did Mesut Ozil back in the day. Uh, also, yeah. w- would be interesting if they if they sell or you know let Mesut Ozil go and then buy another one of Real Madrid's sort of disgruntled superstars, I suppose, or not <laughs> superstar, but but up and coming players. Ozil was certainly a, of a different ilk than than Erdogan when he went to Arsenal. For sure. Be interesting to see how this goes and and fingers crossed for Arsenal's sake, uh, we see the best of him because um, I think we can all agree we're in need of a bit of a spark in that final third. It's been an issue for us throughout the course of this season. There's no question about that. Um, Jonas, thank you so much, mate, uh, for taking the time. I know you're super busy and particularly uh, at this time of year. So I really, really appreciate it. How can our listeners uh, follow you on social media and keep up with the great work that you do? Uh, everything is at Che Guevara, C-H-E-G-I-A-E-V-A-R-A. There you go. I actually managed to spell that. That's, uh, that's the first one, I think. Uh, that's on every social media. That's Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, even, I believe. Uh, so you can sort of add me to every one of those and keep up with both my professional and personal life, I suppose. <laughs> Brilliant stuff. Um, I'll leave that in the description as well uh, for those of you thank to you. just click on the link. Jonas, thank you so much, mate. And I'm sure we'll speak again soon. All the best. You as well. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You're listening to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast. I'm Martin Tyler, and you're listening to Harry Simeon.